Fantastic. Great to be here, you guys, and uh, thanks for the invitation to tell you a little bit about what my lab is working on. The title is Microphysiological Systems for Immune Cell Trafficking and Capture. I'm going to tell you about a couple of projects. One of them involves the bone marrow, and one of them involves CAR T cells. So let's see here. So just quick disclosure, I'm a co-founder of Eric Carey Biosciences, and they have a presence here, and uh, what you'll hear about the bone marrow is part of their commercialization plan. My lab um, is kind of a weirdly split between professional staff, project scientists, and grad students. Uh, I had three postdocs finish in the last year, so I'm trying to sort of fill that gap. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some work and the names that are bold-faced. Dan Link, Saul Priceman are the key collaborators. Uh, Venkatesh Shire is a uh, project scientist, and another person in the group, um, Drew Glazer, actually recently finished her postdoc and is now at J&J. &J. So my lab is definitely an organ on a chip lab, um, tissue engineering kind of broadly speaking, microfluidics, microfabrication. My training is as a chemical engineer, so I really like transport related problems. And it turns out these devices are really good to look at the transport of cells. So over the last three to five years, I would say cellular trafficking has been a pretty strong theme. I won't be able to tell you about all the projects that are ongoing, but I am going to tell you about the ones in red, the bone marrow on a chip and immune cell migration, which is into a tumor microenvironment, so it kind of crosses over into the tumor on a chip field. So this audience um, probably is uh, very much aware of the major immune cells that traffic through our bodies. Um, we are particularly interested in these concepts at the bottom. All of these cells, I don't expect you to read all those details, but you're familiar with them. They're cells representing the adaptive and the innate system. They all require cues to direct or guide their migration. They all require cues to exert their effector functions, such as cell killing, and they can all potentially be manipulated for therapeutic applications. So those are kind of the broad um, themes that uh, my lab spends most of our time thinking about. I've got projects that involve four of those five cells. I haven't figured out how to get NK cells into the lab yet, but I'm going to only have time to tell you a little bit about a T cell project. It's actually CAR T cells and also neutrophils coming from the bone marrow. So this picture kind of depicts uh, the way that we're uh, sort of bringing all of our projects together. It doesn't include all of the components of the immune system. There's certainly the spleen's not here and the lymph nodes aren't. But you'll see uh, bone marrow derived cells uh, coming on the left, moving through the circulation. They have to decide at some point in time whether or not they're going to jump off that highway. If they do, they have to migrate somewhere and they have to find their cell to exert their effector function. And we have projects that are involved in all five of these steps. I'll show you about just a couple of them today. So questions, can we model bone marrow production and egress? What are the guidance cues and over what dimensions are they actually acting? Can we impact T and B cell trafficking? And can we find and isolate rare and specific B and T cells? There's a fourth question or a fifth question I didn't have on here. We're also working on a computational algorithm to actually help us design T cell receptors as well. So I'll tell you about two projects. The first one is vascularized bone marrow. This is the project um, or the project that is being commercialized by Eric Carey. We have a small SBIR grant to get that off the ground, and it's on the far left-hand side of that. And our paper came out just in January. Drew's the first author on this paper. She's the postdoc that finished in September and started working at J&J. &J. And Dan Link is the, uh, my card-carrying bone marrow expert from my time at Washington University in St. Louis. So the general methods, um, we started out by trying to think about modeling the bone marrow by separating what's generally considered to be the two niches, the endosteal niche and the perivascular niche. And we let them communicate by little pores that you can see here, um, just by diffusion. There's no convection between those two. The two niches are the same in that they contain endothelial cells, and they both contain a hematopoietic stem cell. They differ in the stromal population. On the endosteal side, we use a fetal osteoblast cell line. And on the right side, we use a commercially available, it's a mixed bone marrow stromal population that we get from Lanza, but it does not have osteoblasts. And that's what separates the two niches. If you seed them together in the right um, conditions, they'll form a nice vascular network over the course of, say, four to seven days. And then you have a window of time where you can do some kind of cool studies. So I did not, oh, the animation works. <laughs> So Drew did the animation. I'm not so good at that. So you can digest these cells out actually with natokinase. And once you do, you can do just standard assays like flow cytometry. And we do sort of the poor man's version of a bone marrow transport, the methacult assay, because we don't have enough cells to actually do a transplant into a mouse. But I'll show you some data from that. And here's kind of a nice picture on the scale of what that device looks like. 
So I'll show you some pretty pictures here. Uh, it's a pretty nice uh, chance to get a nice vascular network that forms. This is, uh, I think, day seven. You'll see the uh, vascular networks forming on both sides. This is just stain for CDH5 or VE cadherin. The vascular network on the endosteal side usually looks a little rattier. It's never quite as nice over there. I'm not sure exactly what that means yet. We're still working on that. And on the right-hand side is the perivascular niche. You can actually perfuse these vascular networks. I would say this works about 50% of the time. I'm never going to tell you this works every time, but we can get anastomosis and we can get a perfusible network. This is 70 kilodalton dextran moving through here, and you'll see it's more permeable over here in the endosteal niche. It's relatively easy to make permeability measurements. So I just show a highlighted region here, and you can watch this dye move out, and the mathematics for estimating the permeability are pretty straightforward, and we get permeabilities that are about twofold higher than when we use other stromal cells, um, simply more consistent with the sinusoidal and more permeable network of the bone marrow. Here's a nice picture. It took a while to get used to looking at pictures of the bone marrow. Drew would come into my office and show me these, and I'm like, what is this? I don't I have no idea, right? Bone marrow is super messy, super cellular, right? But that's actually good. That's exactly what you want to have. So this is a, a labeling a number of things. CD34 labels the hematopoietic stem cell, but it also, you can see, labels the vascular network. And then we have um, a lineage marker. It labels a broad number of markers for leukocytes in dark blue, and then DAPI here as well. So this is a confocal stack image. And what I want to just highlight here in yellow is this little niche right here is really what we're trying to simulate. So I'll show you that in um, larger magnification and just one stack. So this is really my favorite uh, image from her work. This black region out here is the actual the vascular lumen, right? No cells there right there. And then we have the endothelial cells lining this really beautiful niche and the CD4 label here on one of the hematopoietic stem cells. And then you see a variety of cells in different stages of differentiation, most of them in the myeloid lineage. And I'll show you that. That's really the vast majority of cells that your bone marrow makes and just a standard H&E stain of regular human bone marrow on the right. So uh, one thing that Dan Link taught me when we first started working on bone marrow is you better be able to maintain a hematopoietic stem cell if anyone's going to believe that you have a decent model of the bone marrow. So that's really what we focused on um, heavily. So you'll see the uh, bone marrow over here. We use the methacold assay and these GEMM or multipotent colonies that will go to all the different lineages and it's based on um, morphologic features in this methacold assay. But you can see both niches actually support these out to 14 days. The perivascular niche does a little better job. If you culture these things with a single niche or monolayer, you essentially get none, um, except for this funny outlier here. So the perivascular niche may be able to, under some circumstances, support the hematopoietic stem cell. This is a very dynamic environment. If you take time-lapse videos, uh, it'll be quite shocking to you what happens in these microphysiological systems. So these cells are moving around all the time. And when I saw this image, I talked to Drew about this area down here on the left and the right, and the idea that maybe our bone marrow was spitting out cells, egressing cells, and that might be an interesting model of what's going on in our peripheral blood. And that's a pretty easy marker, right? We can draw peripheral blood. So we started thinking about whether or not we could use this as a model of neutropenia. So most of these cells that are coming out are CD66B positive right here, this population here. That's a marker of a relatively mature neutrophil. And here we just did some very simple um, drug studies. Doxorubicin will take out your bone marrow, and here we see um, this is the um, uh, CD66B positive population. So it's present primarily in the perivascular niche, goes down when you treat with doxorubicin, and when you stimulate the bone marrow with GCSF, you can see an increase. So it was really just our initial foray into some simple drug studies to see if we could get a decent response. Project two, CAR T-cell trafficking in an immunosuppressive tumor environment. I mentioned that these fluidic devices, I've worked with Venkatesh now for about seven years in my lab, and he's also a chemi by training, so we just go down to these transport problems all the time. But soluble mediators, you can study these, but what they're really good for is cellular trafficking. So Saul Priceman is at City of Hope in LA, and he designs CAR T-cells, so we have kind of a very natural um, collaboration, and we're interested in this part of my image right here, how do CAR T-cells decide whether or not they can jump off, and once they do, do they migrate into this tumor microenvironment and maintain some, um, some level of their effector function? If any of you are working the CAR T-cell field, um, you'll know that one of the major problems in the field is the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. You can give all these CAR T-cells, but they usually don't do much once they get there. 
So CAR T-cell therapy, just quickly, you take T-cells out, you reprogram with a chimeric antigen receptor that's specific for a tumor antigen, you um, expand them, and then you inject them back into the patient, and, and you hope that it destroys the tumor. This works great for blood-based cancers like leukemias that are targeting CD19, not so great for solid tumors, primarily because of this immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. I want you to take away from this image that immunosuppression is complicated. It's not simple. It involves lots of things the tumor does to stay around. There's multiple cell types down here. We've sort of focused our attention on the tumor-associated macrophage and this old school sort of um, splitting of macrophages into M1-like, which tend to be pro-inflammatory anti-tumor and M2-like, which tend to be pro-tumor, pro-angiogenic, and anti-inflammatory, seems to still work pretty well for what we're trying to achieve. So how do we study this? We have a relatively simple device that we use for lots of studies in our labs. It has five parallel chambers. In this case, we actually line the central channel with endothelial cells, so this becomes our vascular conduit. And then in the neighboring channels up here is where we can actually load any population of tumor cells, macrophages, stromal cells, or whatever we want to do to model our tumor microenvironment. And the pressure is high here. We have leaking interstitial fluid that leaks out and collects in these outer channels. And here's where we can introduce our CAR T cells. So here's just a quick image that shows when we put in um, M2-like macrophages, we can get a, a more prominent angiogenic response. The red cells are a prostate cancer cell line that we get from Saul Priceman. Sorry, I'm tapping these too quickly here. Um, here we've actually introduced M1-like macrophages on the left and M2 macrophages on the right, and the macrophages are in, uh, sorry, the CAR T cells are in this sort of uh, aqua blue, and all I want you to take away is you get a lot more CAR T cells into the microenvironment when you have M1 macrophages than when you have M2, and you should see more um, tumor growth there uh, on the M2 side as well. This can be quantified, I won't really belabor the point, but you see if you uh, look, for example, here at the yellow, you see uh, more tumor, or sorry, these are, uh, yeah, this is full tumor growth. You see more tumor growth when you have um, a sort of negative control CAR T compared to when you have a, a specific one. This is a breast cancer model. Uh, this is the hot off the press here. We're using a tezeluzumab, which is a PD-1L inhibitor. So one uh, thought in the field is that you can use combination therapies to sort of reduce that immunosuppression. So here's our um, control condition. We see lots of CAR T cells actually moving into this microenvironment. When we put in M2 macrophages, it almost completely stops CAR T cell trafficking into that compartment. And when we treat pre-treat with atezolizumab for three days, we can almost recover. We can't completely recover, but we know that pdl one blockade is actually doing something to overcome that immunosuppression. The red is tumor growth. So you can quantify that. This is CAR T cells in the chamber. So lots of CAR T cells. You give M2s, you get almost none. You put in the atezolizumab, you recover some. And this is also dead cells. You can actually track this with something like DRAC7 dye. And you can see M2 actually um, uh, inhibits tumor cell killing. You put in the CAR T cells, you get some. Atezolizumab, you get a lot more. Sorry, there was a duplicate of that slide. The last three projects I can't really tell you anything about, but we're capturing rare B cells following in influenza infection. That means capturing these cells that are right here, and it also involves part of the effector function. I have a project on monocyte recruitment from tumor cells uh, using um, tumor cell-derived extracellular vesicles. That's a collaboration with Randy Carney and a graduate student, uh, Pete Sariana, who's just finishing. And also, um, Zach Rollin is just finishing his PhD. He's a kind of a computational nerd in only the best way. So this is computation in microfluidics to design T cell receptors. I'd love to tell you more about it. We have a paper in press and another one in the same journal that's in review. So let me wrap up. I really hope we have time for questions. I won't actually read my summary. I think you'll sort of get the general idea that these fluidic devices are really fantastic to look at cellular trafficking events and modeling very specific features of the immune system. So thank you very much.